Hello and welcome to our pulmonary rehab lesson on the anatomy of the respiratory system. I'm Julia O'Shea. I'm a respiratory therapist, aka the lung lady. Um, I just gave myself that nickname because I feel like you need one when you're on YouTube. So lung lady, let's get started. I'm going to try and keep this shorter than my last one because I know not many people like to view long videos on YouTube. Okay, so anatomy of the lungs, here we go. Um, when we speak about the respiratory system, it's good to understand what we mean by the word system. So the body is divided into different systems based on the function they serve. So for example, Obvious one is our digestive system for our food. We have our cardiovascular, our circulatory system. They all serve a very specific function. Our respiratory system is responsible for bringing in that oxygen, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So we're gonna talk about how does that happen. So our respiratory system starts at the tip of our nose and our mouth. It goes down through the upper airway, the back of the throat, through the trachea or the windpipe, all the way down into our lungs where we have our airways, we have those tiny air sacs we refer to as the alveoli, and then all the way down to the diaphragm. Um, I'm gonna speak about the upper respiratory tract first, and then I'll talk about the lower respiratory tract, and then I'll go into what happens with the, the actual physiology of the lungs, dependent on what type of lung disease you may have. Okay, so upper airway. So breathing with our nose is by far one of the best ways to breathe. Easier said than done. Um, but our nose is structurally designed specifically for breathing. So every time we inhale through our nose, the air gets warm. So we have a lot of blood vessels around our nose. So if you've ever been punched in the nose or got a bloody nose, you know how much blood actually comes out of your nose. And that's just because of all the, the vasculature, all the vessels that are around your nose. Um, but it also helps to filter the air. So Every time we take a breath, it filters out the things that we don't want going into the lungs. Um, it provides humidity because our lungs appreciate nice, clean, warm air. And then it also helps to smooth the flow. Um, so a term we use a lot in um, respiratory is, is flow because air has certain properties in the way that it moves. And this is physics. So when we take a breath in with our nose, you can feel just how the air moves all the way down into your lungs. So it has a smoother, or what we say, more laminar flow. When we breathe through our mouth, it, for me, it feels quite different because the air does not have these passageways for it to find this nice, smooth flow. So we would say the air is more turbulent when you breathe through your mouth, which means it may not get down as deep as you want it to go. So always think, breathe through your nose, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But our mouth does help with breathing, obviously. I call it the pop-off valve. When you get a shorter breath, you start huffing and puffing through your mouth. Um, and then it's also part of our digestive system. Um, the pharynx or the throat, um, this is primarily um, designed to help protect um, your lungs. So we don't want things going down the wrong way. And you may be able to see my mouse here. So the blue um, arrows on this picture are showing airflow. So we want the air to move down into the lungs. And so this kind of pinkish tube is our airway. And it goes straight down into the lungs or our trachea. Um, what is right next to it, very, very close, is our esophagus. So that's where our food goes. So you can see how close they are and how amazing it is that the, the body is designed to have these protective mechanisms that ensure every time we swallow, whether we have food in our mouths or not, that that saliva is going down into our esophagus 
and not into our lungs. So there's so many little features in place that help prevent things from going down the wrong way. And then lastly, our larynx, which is our vocal cords, which is right here, um, obviously used to speak, um, but they also open and close and help to protect um, things from going down into the lungs. So real quick, I'm just gonna talk about benefits of using your nose. There's a lot of information out there, but basically it helps to reduce stress, calms the nervous system, can help drop our blood pressure, um, produces something called nitric oxide. And this is just a gas that can help to improve oxygenation in our lungs. Um, if you are someone who snores or maybe you sleep next to someone who snores, you might notice when they're snoring, their mouth is open. So if you can um, breathe through your nose, you're probably going to sleep better and your partner will sleep better too. Um, using our nose helps to engage the diaphragm better. So again, that's our primary muscle that we use for breathing. Um, and because it's a filtration device, it helps to prevent us from catching a cold. So it'll catch some of the bacteria, bacteria, bugs, things like that that might be in the air. And then also, again, coming back to that physics um, idea of flow. So when you breathe through your nose, and you can test that out and just notice the difference, it helps the air get deeper into your lungs. And then there's so much more. Um, but just thinking about breathing through your nose is, uh, is a good way to go. Okay, so I'm just briefly going to talk about the sinuses. Obviously, when Sinuses are nice and clean, nothing's going on, no infection, you feel really good. And then the picture on the right, this gentleman obviously has some sort of infection going on, the whole irritation of the eyes, maybe you're sneezing. Um, the reason I just mentioned this is because this is part of our respiratory system. And if you're dealing with you know, allergies or chronic post-nasal drip, things like that, that could be impacting your lungs as well. Um, and you may, you know, if it's bad enough, you may have to see a specialist like an ENT um, to see what's going on in there. It can be quite irritating. Okay, so here are vocal cords. So there are these um, whitish bands, and this opening right here goes straight into your lungs. So I think of these as kind of like our, our um, last defense system to keep the lungs protected. Um, so here they are closed, and then here they are open. And I have another picture. It's a little bit more graphic because it's taken, it's a real picture. Um, so if you're someone who's kind of squeamish with medical photos, then turn your head. Okay, so here is um, the picture of the vocal cords, and you can see they're very moist, um, which is what we like in the lungs. We want our respiratory system to um, function properly, and not be dried out. So we, we like that moisture. Um, this area around it is called the epiglottis. And um, it is the, it's like this little flap that closes over this opening every time you swallow um, to prevent food, saliva, all those things from getting into your lungs. Really, really amazing design. Our bodies are amazing. Okay, so let's get into the lower airways. And so here it's just showing a picture of um, once you get down into past, you know, the, the protective structures, your, your pharynx, and you get down past your vocal cords, then you have the trachea, which branches off into your right and your left lung. Um, I have some better pictures coming up. But um, just a little fun fact for you, because being the lung lady, I am full of fun facts related to the lungs. Um, so the, the airways that go into the right lung, um, or the, the bronchus as we call it, um, is at an angle of about, uh, I'd say 25 to 35 degrees. Um, meaning that it's a little bit more of a straight shot to get into the right lung. And then the, the airway that goes into the left lung is more like a 45 degrees. So it's a little bit harder to get into that lung. And by get into it, I'm referring to 
bacteria and things like that that want to get into your lungs they want to get into your mucus so that they can proliferate so they can grow and cause infections so the fun fact for you is that pneumonia is more common in the right lung because of the, the design and the shape not to say you can't get it in the left lung but just something to be aware of especially if you've had pneumonia before um, Usually it can get down and we say like a right lower lobe pneumonia. All right, so I have a better picture here of the, of the lungs themselves. So the right lung, three lobes. So we have the upper, the middle, and the lower. And something else you may not be aware of is that the right lower lobe actually wraps around the back side of the body. So most of what's going on here is your right lower lobe. And then the left lung, two lobes. And usually I quiz my patients on this, but since it's just me by myself, I have to quiz myself. Um, but the, the, the reason why the left lung, and you can probably guess by looking at this picture why it only has two, is because what's missing is the heart. So the heart sits right there, kind of set off center to the left. Um, and the right lung, you can kind of see in this picture, is a little bit bigger than the left lung. I wish I had a picture of the back of the lungs because you would then see that the back of our lungs or the surface area on the back side is larger than the front. So these are all important little trivia things to be aware of, but it applies when we talk about breathing because most people don't think about the space that they're breathing in. And I think there's certain practices like yoga in particular, where we might use the yoga poses and we can access the different areas of our lungs based on our shape. And we teach this in pulmonary rehab. So if you're in one of my classes, this will make more sense to you as you um, do the exercises and the stretching. And this is just showing all the tiny little, we call it the tracheal bronchial tree because it looks like an upside down tree. All right, and so as these airways go smaller and smaller and smaller, we start out with cartilage around them, and then eventually the cartilage disappears and it just goes into smooth muscle. So by cartilage, you can feel that on your trachea when you touch your throat. That's our cartilage. And then as things get smaller, you have the tiny little air sacs called the alveoli. And you can't really see these. You need a microscope. That's how small they are. All right, so talking about the airways or the bronchi, this picture represents like a microscopic view of the lining of our airways. So here we have these little cells called goblet cells because they're shaped like a goblet. And this white stuff that's filled up in these goblet cells and along the top is mucus. Um, the H right here, these are called your cilia, and these are little hairs that help to move the mucus up and out of your lungs. So when I say the word mucus, unless you're a respiratory therapist, you're probably like, ew, gross. But actually, um, mucus is your lungs friend. That's how your lungs take care of themselves. That's how they clean things out. So you want to have a certain amount of mucus. You want it to be thin and you want these little cilia to work so that it pushes the mucus up and out of your lungs. So here's our little fancy cartoon, and it's just showing as this mucus is coming out, um, it might pick up dirt, it might pick up bacteria along the way for you to get it out of your lungs. And there's really only one way to do that, is to cough, is to get that mucus out of your lungs. Um, something worth mentioning, especially if you've ever smoked or you know smokers, is that when you smoke, these cilia don't work. They just quit. They become paralyzed, essentially. And what can happen is um, they do come back, but during the time that you're smoking, they're not able to do their job. And what people might notice if you're a smoker is that when you go to sleep at night, they start working again. And they work 
big time. And they start cleaning up the lungs. And then when you get up in the morning, you might cough and bring up a bunch of mucus in the morning. And that's because these little hairs have had a chance to work and to clean out the airways. But when you quit, which is one of the most important things you can do for your lungs, um, these little cilia, you know, return and do their job to keep your, your lungs nice and clean. All right, so I had a patient one time say, is that a pig snout? No, it's not a pig snout. It's actually a picture um, from a bron bronchoscope, which is this tiny little camera that a pulmonologist can put into your lungs. And this is showing the right and the left um, main stem or the bronchi, the airways. So here you can kind of see this track that's going to the right. So again, what I had mentioned where it's easier to get into the right lung, than the left lung. These are your um, tracheal rings. Um, so I have another fun picture. And unless you're a respiratory therapist or a pulmonologist, you probably don't find these that interesting. But what is interesting is that these airways, there's so many of them and they branch off and they just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and you can kind of see the, the, the mucus, you know, and how we like things to be nice and moist. Okay, so once we get down far enough, um, we get into the alveoli. So this is, this is where the magic happens. Um, so as the air comes in um, and these little sacs open up to um, basically prepare to take in those, those oxygen molecules, you have all the, this vasculature or the, the, the blood vessels basically that wrap around the alveoli. And you can probably see the blue, right? So this is our, 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 our venous blood. And then you can see the red, that's our oxygenated blood. And the purple is where that exchange is happening. So oxygen is coming in, blood turns red, and then carbon dioxide is, is going out. So pretty amazing by my standards. Um, and so within or around these little alveoli, you have what's called the interstitium. So this is that lining, right? So oxygen molecules pass through this lining to be picked up by the blood, taken up to the heart and then pumped out to the rest of the body. And then they're dropping off, the, the venous blood is dropping off that carbon dioxide says goodbye and then you exhale it. And this lining is very important because there are lung diseases that affect this lining. Thus, it affects the way that these molecules move in and out of your alveoli. We'll get to that later. All right, lung ladies, fun fact now. Did you know if you laid out all those little tiny air sacs in your lungs, it would cover more than a tennis court? So that's how much surface area is inside your lungs. Um, there's all sorts of little fun facts like that, but you can wow your friends at your next uh, party once quarantine ends. <laughs> all right, so let's talk a little bit about um, obstructive lung disease, or you may have heard the term COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And COPD is kind of like this umbrella term that can refer to any type of disease that is obstructing your lungs. Um, so some of the more common types are emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and I'll go into more on those. But just with, with COPD, I had heard this one time, and it kind of stuck with me, is that um, it's a disease of the exhale. So it can be fine to get that air into your lungs, but when you go to exhale, it takes longer than normal to get that air out of your lungs. Um, so just something to tuck away, especially if you're someone who has um, COPD. So emphysema, this is um, when for various reasons, um, there can be damage to your tiny little air sacs, to the alveoli. So the picture with the pneumonia is showing 
you know, that, that bacteria getting in there, and again, it can be viral or bacterial, and it does damage inside, and it can leave scar tissue, and it can prevent your alveoli from functioning the way they're supposed to. The middle is showing the normal picture, so I use my hands a lot, so if you can see my hands, think about if my hands are the alveoli, when I take a breath in, they open up, whoop, and then when I exhale, they close. Not all the way, but they, they close in their own way. So inhale, they open, exhale, they close. And then what can happen with, with this picture and the emphysema is that the alveoli might be just a, a little floppy. Um, so when you take a breath in, they take the air, and then when you go to exhale, they're like, eh, I can't exhale the way I want to, because that air gets stuck in there. Um, we use the word elasticity. So they don't have that springy, elasticity anymore, which helps with the exhale. So that's emphysema. Um, bronchitis, or sometimes we refer to it as chronic bronchitis, is basically um, increased mucus, inflammation in your airways. Um, it can come with fatigue, fever, chills, chest discomfort. Sound familiar, anyone? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of these symptoms of lung disease um, sound like what is happening in our world right now, which is pretty scary, but it's good to know and to understand that if you're someone who has lung disease and you have these symptoms, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have coronavirus. These are all common symptoms with lung disease because this is your lungs defense system. Asthma. Asthma sometimes falls into this category. Um, so asthma, classically known as um, tightening of the smooth muscle, which wraps around your airway, uh, the inflammation, the increased mucus, again, sounds very familiar, coughing. Um, so what we try to do is control. So have people taking the medications they need to be on to keep these airways nice and relaxed. All right, going on, interstitial lung disease. So if you remember that picture a few slides ago with the air sac and then the lining around the alveoli, here we have it. So normal on the left, scarred on the right. Various causes, reasons, most of the time we don't even know. But as you can imagine, when these molecules try and get through the scarred lining, it's much harder. For them to pass through. Just uh, some causes of interstitial lung disease. Um, most of the time, like I said, we don't know. It can come from environmental exposure, so dust, asbestos, silica, gases, fumes, poisons. Sometimes medications can cause a reaction, uh, radiation, certain lung infections. And then um, sometimes connective tissue disease. So this would be scleroderma, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So basically things um, that we may not fully understand why the body starts to attack itself and that can cause um, damage around the lining of the alveoli. All right, lungs and the heart. I just love this cartoon. We got something for you. So the lungs are bringing the oxygen, and then the heart has to share it with everybody. I know, I'm a geek. All right, the heart is a two-sided pump, right? So the veins, the blue, right, they bring that, that blood that has already been used up. So they're bringing back to the heart the carbon dioxide, the waste product, specifically to the right side of the heart. The right side then takes that blood and it's like, all right, I gotta send this to the lungs so it can get more oxygen. And then it travels from the lungs back to the left side of the heart and the left side of the heart pumps it out to the rest of the body. Sounds very simple, right? Uh, it's not that simple. <laughs> um, this is, this is a, another picture of the, the heart and the lungs. It's a little busy, but I'll try and explain and help you understand. So if you think of the, the head, the upper body up here, lower body down here, um, I've gone for a walk and my legs have used up the oxygen and that venous blood is now going back to the heart. So there's no pump. It's just passively 
moving back to the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart takes it and then pumps it through the pulmonary artery back into the lungs. You guys remember me talking about that purple where the magic happens? And so that's where those oxygen molecules pass through. The blood gets oxygenated, turns red, goes back to the left side of the heart, and then the left side of the heart pumps it out to the rest of the body. Just this cycle just keeps going and going and going. Um, most of you might know this, but if you look at your, say you look at your, um, your wrist, and maybe you can see the veins, the blue veins, right? Well, you can't see your arteries. They're red or the blood is red, but you can feel them. So that's why, you know, when you feel your pulse, maybe just below your thumb, that's the oxygenated blood that is going out to your hand so that the tissues can, can use that up. All right, and one more lung disease that we'll talk about is pulmonary hypertension. So this is a disease that affects the pulmonary artery. So kind of like the, the word hypertension, I'm sure many of you have heard that before in regards to blood pressure. Um, the pressures are higher in the pulmonary artery. Again, various reasons. Um, sometimes we don't understand why. But in the picture on the left, you can see these vessels are, are just wide open, normal blood flows through them. And then on the right, these vessels are tighter. They're more constricted. And it makes that right side of the heart have to work harder. It pumps really hard. And at times, and you can kind of see it in this picture, but the right side of the heart might be a little bit bigger um, than it should be and it can lead to problems with your valves as well. Um, so just something to be aware of. It's just another type of lung disease. It doesn't necessarily affect the airways in the alveoli, but of course it affects the way the blood, um, the way the blood picks up the molecules, the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. Okay, lastly, some more fun facts for you to wow your friends. So at rest, um, the average person, I would say they breathe 12 to 20 times per minute. Um, so this is a vital sign that we look at. So if you're breathing really fast for no reason, then as a clinician, we want to know what's going on. Why are you breathing? If you're exercising and you're breathing 60 times a minute, totally appropriate. Your lungs are working, your muscles are working, no worries. Um, every day, the average person breathes about 25,000 times by the time you're 70. You've taken at least 600 million breaths. Um, the lungs are the only internal organ that are in direct contact with our atmosphere, right? I think we all understand that very well now. We have our masks that we wear to protect ourselves. And breathing is the only bodily function that can be voluntary or involuntary, meaning I can decide to take a purse lip breath. Or, I don't have to think about it and the body just does it normally because of that we have this it's like a superpower <laughs> so we have this special ability to impact our nervous systems through the breath um, so when you're not feeling good you're anxious whatever you might breathe faster than normal that's okay but that's your nervous system responding to your environment to whatever is happening but when you can allow the body to slow down and maybe relax, then what you may find is that your breathing also slows down. So it's a really good indicator of what's happening with your nervous system. All right, no one can ask me questions, but sometimes it's okay if the only thing you did today was breathe. So thanks for watching everybody. Feel free to subscribe. And if you're in my pulmonary rehab class, I will see you very soon. Write down questions. Let's, um, let's learn as much as we can about the lungs so we can help you understand um, what's going on. All right, take care.